damage was pretty extensive. Just one wave alone, April 14 to 16, 323 tornadoes struck the southeast. Three days of relentless strikes. What can we do about this? I asked. Says Raleigh, the city was under attack by Mother Nature. Four EF5s on April 27. Seen this in Tuscaloosa. May 22nd, Joplin. And tornadoes all the way on up, even hitting Minneapolis. And of course, the Joplin tornado. Big, massive. Mother Nature having her way with us. And the EF5 and two EF4s on May 24th. Another tornado is in Oklahoma, including this big one. And the one that Chris Novi will never, ever forget. So, <clears throat> as Darth Nader, it is time to look at storm shelters, and that's what this talk is about. How do we protect ourselves against Mother Nature? But first, I want to talk about the need for storm chasers. This program, as you all know, was canceled, and it was quite unfortunate. I personally have contacted the Discovery Channel. And I have talked with them about why this show was canceled. They said it was due to financial difficulties. So I came up with an idea. Why don't we combine some of these television shows? Right? Let's combine them. Thereby saves you money. Okay. Let's do... Chasing an American Java. All right, what's wrong with that? And that looks like Scott Peak to me. What about swamp chasers? You know, combining those two. And uh, I don't know who that is in the lower left, but uh, he isn't here, I don't think. How about say yes to the dress and stone chasing? How about that? Sounds pretty good to me. Godfather chases. Going up to Don Carleon and saying, I think there's a slight risk out to the panhandles. My favorite happens to be Storm Chaser Jeopardy. That's right, so you can win money here. Um, pick your category here, old tornadoes, for a hundred dollars. And this is an actual Answer on Jeopardy. The probe used to investigate tornadoes in this film is aptly named Dorothy. Yeah, what is Tristan? You have to say what is. Okay, so it's time to give me shelter and give me shelter. Where do we need the shelter? We need it where the tornadoes are most deadly, more than anywhere else, and that happens to be the eastern part of the U.S. Houses are going to look like this. You know that. This is a slab house. This is a house that is on a pier and beam foundation. There is no safety here. There's only injury or death. We make it so easy for Mother Nature to strike our empire. And it's time that we do something about it. So, after the 2003 tornadoes that hit Oklahoma City, tornado shelters began occurring. Seems like you have to have a major disaster in order to have some sort of effect take place. And in this case, all those green triangles our tornado shelters were put on. This is a cause and effect. But 
money is not everywhere to fund shelters, especially when we have disastrous years like we just had. The federal government then freezes funding for Joplin. So what this boils down to is this. If you're lucky enough, and I use the word luck loosely, if you're lucky enough to get hit early in the year, then there's money available. But if you're unlucky to get hit late in the year, then you're a double whammy there. No funding's available to subsidize shelters. So, after Tuscaloosa, 1,159 shelters were approved by FEMA, and they'll pay 50 to 75 percent. Then in Joplin, sorry folks, there have been too many tornadoes this year. You have to do on your own. No subsidies. And then <coughs> in the news, they start fighting over money, of course. 7.4 million is allocated for the Tuscaloosa area, but that wasn't enough. All these municipalities wanted a piece of that, and they, they needed 60 million. So the fight is, it's our money, it's our money, and they start fighting over shelters. Who's going to get them? What was interesting about this is that finally, tornado, uh, the Tornado Commission recommends more shelters, and they approach the governor of the state of Alabama. If you can read the bottom here, unfortunately, that meeting had to be canceled because of severe weather. We had all these recommendations, and that was it. So, let's talk about types of residential shelters. We can try to defeat the forces of Mother Nature. Now, when it comes down to it, I'm going to show you how the dark side of the force can help you survive Mother Nature. You know, early residential shelters were like this. This is not any good. This is not going to do anything but make you part of a shish kebab. The standard building code of the United States, or empire as I call it, is 90 mile per hour, 3 second gust at 10 meters. The building code does consider hurricanes, but does not consider tornadoes to be the threat. So you're on your own. Everything is built to this code. I'm talking about houses, this building we're in, Home Depot, Walmarts, whatever, all built 90 miles per hour, except down in the hurricane-prone zones. Fortunately, in 2008, a building code standard was approved by the ICC for the construction of storm shelters. And this was a fantastic step forward, but unfortunately, a little too late for this last tornado season. Concrete shelters are predominant out there. As long as CMU, brick, steel, wood, all these can be made formidable to resist the attacks of Mother Nature. It can be a lot ground below, inside or outside your house. And the ICC 500 is the book out there. You can find it online, and it actually has details on how to construct a storm shelter. So, what are the reasons for storm shelters? Security, safe room, sound recording studio, wine cellar, for those of you who like wine. I can store your chase images and equipment. Yep. Chris Novi has a lot of equipment, so you may want to think about this. All right, the dark room. Well, a great place to get away from the kids and put them. They're soundproof. Okay. So there's also FEMA 320, and these web links will be on my Facebook page. You can get these links specifically and get these all free PDFs. Residential safe rooms and how to construct them. One of the best sources is FEMA.gov slash library. So, 
So looking at residential shelter requirements, obviously you don't want them flooded. You don't want to drown in a storm shelter. They have to be designed between the point where you're at, 130 and 250 miles an hour. This is much, much stronger than your building code. 180 mile an hour wind is not twice as strong as a 90 mile per hour wind, but is four times as strong. Much more resistance. It must resist the impact of a 15 pound 2x4 at both horizontal and vertical speeds. And there are definitely lots of requirements on height and width and ventilation. Door height. You want to, don't want to hit your head too many times on the shelter going in. You must have proper venting and means of escape. So an actual secondary safety escape hatch is now required on storm shelters. So here's the, what the building code recommends. 250 mile an hour design. So this part of the U.S., 200, then goes down further to uh, 150 and so forth. Concrete shelters. Here is the plan looking down for a concrete shelter. We have basically steel rebar going around here, and then the dots are actually vertical rebar. You'll have your door. There'll be a escape hatch up at the roof level. There's a side view. You have a concrete cap on it, solid concrete, definitely anchored into the foundation. Here's the foundation detail up close, having a footing under it because of the extra load in the wall system. And here's how you make them. You have a form, you come on in, you go ahead and place that around and pour concrete in there. Or you can build it up in CMU which is normally quite vulnerable to tornadic winds. But if you go ahead and put steel rebar in it and attach it properly, it turns out it's not such a bad place to be. Or a precast one that you just buy and have a truck over to your house and put it in the yard. 4,000, usually is about average. They range from, I've seen them as low as 1,800 to as high as you want to go. You can really pimp these out if you like. The name of the game is rebar. Having enough of it. <laughs> when the concrete comes on in, this is a view looking down, and this is across. And here is the actual building of a shelter, the concrete pumping unit, pumping in the concrete here, at the top, and the shelter there. So here's what the house looks like as it's being constructed. It's a little more difficult to do this when the house is already built. And you can see the house is not going to be attached to anything much. Maybe some shot pins or something. But the heck with the house. Not really interested in the house anyways, making it tornado proof. It's the shelters we're more interested to save people against the wrath of Mother Nature. And they'll have a steel door in here. The shelter cannot be tied to anything in the building, it must be a free standalone so that it doesn't accept loads from anywhere else. There's your door. So, have it in your garage, like a safe. Out in the back. Oh, good God. When you plant a few roses around it or something, but. <laughs> a little a little dark light, doesn't it? <laughs> and how are these done and been, been tested by real tornadoes? This one here in 2003. I saw personally and saw how it would work perfectly. This is another one. This is an in the garage shelter. Did a wonderful job standing up. The house is destroyed. <laughs> but the shelter's fine and if you were in there You'd be fine. <laughs> More recently, on May 24th, there were three ER5 candidates in central Oklahoma, and I looked at them. They were all very intense. But the untold story here was about 40 or 50 people survived by being in these tornado shelters. 
You don't see this written up in the press. All we hear about are people that die. You don't hear about people's lives who are saved. Lived! And here, this shelter saved a family. This is the only thing left of their house. And they did have an exterior skin penetration of the shelter door. But the interior was not penetrated, so it still would pass ICC 500. One of the problems, though, with the lock system is it was damaged. So these people were trapped. They did not have an escape door. Unfortunately, they had neighbors who knew about them, and they came to the rescue and got them out of there. So these locked doors can be punched in. That's why the secondary escape must be done on the new shelters. And testament of how many people will survive these kinds of shelters. There's your house. What's left of it is demolished, except for the safe. So they can come in all sizes and shapes. And because of all the disasters, there is a boom in the amount of tornado shelter companies. And they are growing every single day, testing their products. There's an in-ground shelter before the house is built. And you use it as a hidey hole. I'm sure Saddam wishes he had one of those. Now with every in-house shelter, there are also out-house shelters. But these are not safe places to be in. Okay, even if they have signs on them saying tornado shelters, they're still not places to be in. So you don't want to go in an outhouse shelter. Maybe you do. Uh, partially below ground shelters are usually the shelter of choice because they cost only about eighteen hundred dollars. And they're prefab with two pieces and they have a steel door. These are the old shelters that have one door, they don't have really any ventilation here, no escape hatch. But it comes in in two pieces, basically a box is lowered into the ground, and then you cap it on off. You put some caulk around it, and then put the cap on it on down. So as far as safety is concerned, it's a matter of choice, which is an illusion between those who have shelters and those who do not have shelters. Good Here God. We have a demolished home on May 24, and yet we have a surviving tornado shelter, and a family lived because of this. They went to their shelter. There's another family, this is Jim Ledoux, looking down into this shelter. Homeowners survived down there. Their house did. This is what it looks like inside the shelter. When you close the lid, you are now on the dark side. So being on the dark side ain't so bad, is it? The dark side from the force, that's where you want to be. Yes, can you feel the power of the dark side? Maybe a little spooky at first, but you know, you have to deal with that. Can you sense the force of the dark side all around you? It's not such a bad place to be, especially when you have a EF5 rolling over your head. So being on the dark side of the force, your tornado shelter, parentheses, you can survive an EF5. You can survive an EF5. You can survive an EF5. Turn around, don't drown. I think that's sketchy. Proof. Joplin. Didn't hear about this. You didn't hear about the people that were saved in Joplin by tornado shelters. You heard about the deaths. This family was saved by that tornado show. Now, they don't have to be in big fancy houses. You can have your mobile homes, have a porch shelter. What you need to do is protect the occupants for until the tornado goes by. They come in all shapes and sizes. And sometimes you don't even know that they look like a shelter. Masonry shelters. This is some diagrams from FEMA. These are concrete masonry units with vertical steel. And you fill every one of those cells with grout, looking down on it. Every one of those dots is a vertical rebar. It's an eight inch thick wall. 
and you put a concrete cap on it. If you don't have any of that, then it's just a bunch of blocks standing up, and it can fall right on over. Here is the plan view diagram. Again, looking down, there's your hollow block cells going around, the steel door, the emergency escape, and again, grounded cells, and the vertical dots for rebar. Your plan view, and you're looking at side view. Again, you've got your cap on the top with your emergency escape, and down here, connected to the foundation. And you'll have to have a little footing for that, because you've got extra load carrying down on your slab. So here's what some of the masonry shelters look like. These hollow cells here are so when they pour the grout in the top, they can tell they've got it coming out the bottom here, and they've got a full wall. There's no voids in it. And looking for brick masonry. You put two widths of brick, fill that void with concrete and rebar, you have yourself a tornado shelter. And here are some of those kinds of shelters. Some of them you can just have installed in your house. There's one that's ready to use. Steel shelters. Steel shelters are brought to you by Chewy's Christmas album. That's right. The steely voice. You know, featuring away in the, I don't know, can't pronounce that. We three, I can't pronounce that. All right. Steel shelters dropped in. Already prefab. Drop right on into your house. Boom. There's your tornado shelter. You just build the frame around it. There you go. Not a bad place. You put them in a the garage. Extra thick storage closet. And they're bolted down. This is looking down. It's bolted down at the foundation. Bolted up to the ceiling level. Not a bad place. Steel shelters can go in the ends of houses. Look at this construction here. This house would be toast in a tornado, especially with all the trees around it. But you can fight back the forces of Mother Nature. No reason to die anymore by her hand. No homes, having one on the end. Just a small closet like this could be the decision between life and death. Even small bench style shelters right here. Get close to your family, get to know them. Even put one in your garage. Cut out part of the slab, drop in an already made steel shelter. There you go. And right on down, you can also change the oil if you have to, right? Try to sell that one to your spouse. And if you drive over it, no big deal as long as the door is closed. You want to have the door open, not good. So steel shelters, some of them are huge like this. They come in, in, you pop them in the ground, you go downstairs, you can have hardwood flooring if you like, interior lighting, the television. You have a lot of things with this kind of a shelter. Fiberglass shelters are brought to you by Storm Chaser Fiberglass Rockets. That's right. You can buy these. <clears throat> so the next time you see this, my attitude is, Give them a storm chaser. Launch one. All right, in the ground, fiberglass shelters. Yep, they look comfortable. <clears throat> Have some lights, you throw pillows, some nice romantic music. Hey, what do you know? Almost as good as a spa. And even bring the TV down so your cat can watch the favorite movie. Uh, water composite shelters. Same idea. This time, build a wood frame around it. And then you can sheave it with what's called a Kevlar board. It's a laminate board that can stop a bullet. It can also stop a 2x4 traveling at 100 miles an hour. Here's the connection to the slab foundation. You've got to have a connection all the way down. Tornadoes have three types of motion. It has the lateral motion, 
comes on in and tries to rock it or throw it over. It's got the upward motion and it's got this radial. So here you've got a Kevlar panel and your door is also steel and the Kevlar will stop aboard going in at 100 miles an hour. The installation process is pretty similar to just putting up a sheet of plywood. And plywood is not as good as Kevlar. Community shelters. What do community shelters look like? This is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about this kind of community. I'm talking about community shelters that have additional building code requirements. And these include to have handicap access, fire extinguishers. You do have to have a toilet and exterior uh, emergency lighting as well as interior and, of course, ventilation. So, FEMA has publications out on this. The FEMA 361 document, second edition. Again, I'll have this posted on my Facebook page as far as the link is concerned. So, FEMA has known this for quite some time. After a major disaster, FEMA goes in and they actually go ahead and build the community shelters. There's one. You can put 50 people in here and you can survive an EF5. Here's what it looks like inside. Too bad, even has a vent there. Steel door. You can have electricity in them. ELC centers can be put in them. They have it in the factories. Go down into your shelter in a factory. You can watch your nice 3D tornado videos down there. Of course, in the future, it'll all be just 3D live stream. And your school shelters. I mean, that's where a lot of kids are. Tornadoes happen a lot during the uh, school hour. So, I mean, that just makes sense. And FEMA has documents on how to do this. Where to go in a school for protection. Most schools that I see do not have adequate protection for tornadoes. Look at this. Kelly Elementary. May 1999 tornado destroyed this school. Had it been in session, you'd have at least 100, 200 fatalities here. The original school plans were to put the kids in the hallways. That's the original plan, sort of a figure four shaped school. And here's what the walls were for your quote, shelter. A bunch of hollow blocks that didn't have any vertical reinforcement. What do you think happened to those in the, in the tornado, the designated tornado oh, shelter yeah. area? What do you think happened to those? Yes, your blocks just fell. And these blocks weigh 10 or 12 pounds a piece, and they're very deadly. A lot of crushing injuries. Even though you're trying to protect your head, still, there's only so much a body can take. Believe me, I know. Then, if you go ahead and have vertical and steel reinforcement like this, have a load-bearing wall, that's not too good because you have a lot of hollow cells here with the rebar being only where the load is. The end result is you still have a collapsed wall. So can you take a masonry wall, put enough rebar and grout in it, and make it a tornado shelter? Yeah. Yes, it can be done. Costs more money to grout every cell put rebar up every cell. It's very, very possible. There's the new Kelly Elementary. They have the same tornado plan as they did before in 1999. But now, their shelters have this kind of design. They have the design of having steel in every cell grouted. This is now where the kids are going to go. By the way, for those other lovers of other space things, resistance is not futile. You can resist from Mother Nature enough. So do the comparison between what the wall looked like here and what it is now. You see the difference? Big difference. More rebar, more grouting of cells. That's the way to go. Now you can make them very large if you'd like, as long as they can handle 250 mile an hour design. There is a shelter, massive shelter, going up 
on this school. I mean, again, the heck with the school. The kids all know now where to go. They go to a tornado shelter designated at the end of the school. Brings me back to the tornado rules are really different than fire safety rules, right? Fire safety is getting out of the building. Tornadoes, opposite. Some of these are quite large projects. Yes, they cost lots of money. But if you get some help with FEMA, sometimes they can get a 50% subsidy and won't pay half of your shelter. Campground shelters. The camp in Oklahoma tornado went right across the campground. It had people not left there being warned earlier in the day about the severity of the situation. There would have been a lot more in the way of fatalities. Well, by the way, here's your five-day forecast for the planet Algeron. If you know anybody on the planet, um, give them a call, would you? All right, so campground shelters. And FEMA has a publication out on this. Here is a campground shelter going on in. And these are precast concrete pie-shaped planks going on the roof. They're welded together. The walls are all welded together. And that campground can hold several hundred people. Here's how the plates are welded together. As long as you have a good welder, walls are welded to the floor. I stumbled across one on one of my bus chase days in Kansas. Near the town of Coldwater. Anybody ever been to Coldwater? There's one here. It could fit quite a few people, over 100 people here in this campground. So maybe a good place to chase would be to find where those campgrounds are have shelters. We have a party in there. Who's going to know? Hospital shelters. Has there been a hospital hit by a tornado? Absolutely. Yet, there's FEMA already knew about this. And has published Clara Barton Hospital Shelter here in Hoisington, Kansas. And Hoisington was hit many years ago. All they did here was they had a hospital and a clinic, and they decided to go ahead between them and make a shelter in between. So they put steel reinforced concrete right here, made a nice little fill in between the two areas of the hospital. Here's it going up. There's the hallway here. There's the detail, concrete roof. And now that's where the people would go for their tornado watch or warning. They had steel doors, double doors with multiple locks on them. So when you close them, you latch them tight. They're not going to blow open. And debris is not going to penetrate through this kind of shelter. You all know about St. John's here with the destruction here of this hospital. This hospital had a lot of partition walls and a lot of glass and literally blew through the hospital. There's a patient room with a door on the bed. And there were several fatalities here at the hospital in Joplin because of this kind of construction. And, you know, it stands to reason hospitals like to get a lot of open space, a lot of glass, in the schools, makes it a better environment, but it also makes it weak for tornado activity. How do you test these shelters? Well, by the ICC standards, first of all, you've got to do calculations on all sides, making sure that they can withstand the external and internal pressures. Then you're going to be launching missiles, two by fours. Depending upon if you're going to do a tornado shelter or a hurricane shelter, it's a different criteria. And you basically, in whatever zone you're in, you want to go ahead and launch at these speeds right here. Horizontal and vertical. Of course, if you have a nice cannon handy, like this one at Texas Tech, my alma mater, this is where you go ahead and you shoot all day long. And basically, hit the doors and the shelters in different places and see if you have any penetration. This is a impact zones on the shelter. Pretty much the same thing for the door. And you probably have seen nice videos of this on YouTube. 
for these boards coming on in and penetrating. Well, it's a failure, but they should just turn them into matchsticks. And if you turn it into matchsticks, that's a, that's a pass. Some doors do well, other doors do not do so well. Quality latches and braces are very important. That is a heavy duty latch. And of course, cross bracing prevents Mother Nature from entering. Good quality hinges, multiple locks like on your air can, uh, aircraft doors would be a great idea. Now, let me talk about some shelters that simply don't work. During the school bus, that's Sonata. That isn't going to work very well. Uh, two by fours can penetrate the school bus, but if you have a spare school bus around, you know, what do you do with it? This is not what you do with it. Don't make it a tornado shelter. So you don't like that RV anymore? Bearing an RV is not the best tornado shelter either. It's a little difficult to uh, turn on the air conditioning, and also they buried the damn door on the thing, so how are you going to get in it? Uh, turkey vultures, though, they seem to know that that's a good place to, to roost. Okay. So kind of doing some of these uh, reiterations of talks prior, you know, vehicles, places to be in a tornado as stormtroopers as we are. Um, let's take a look at this. Anybody have a Dodge Avalanche sitting around? Uh, this Dodge Avalanche is in this driveway, one half a mile, landing in this ravine. That's what it used to look like. And this is what it looked like upon impact a half a mile later. This is just the skin. The engine block was sitting down here, and so was uh, an axle. The other axle was gone somewhere else. So. And we chase in what? Vehicles, don't we? So uh, again, reiterating Chris, don't get involved too close uh, with tornadoes. There are wheel loft and fly a car. That to them is easy going. All right. If that isn't enough for you, how about a silver Dodge Ram? We're sitting right here in the garage. Took its first bounce right here, where most of it ended up, and then the hood and other debris went up here, half a mile. Beautiful truck. And here's the first impact. Part of the axle wheel frame here. So Dodge Ram, not too tough. Both tubs. I always hear about going to the bathtub. <clears throat> going to the bathroom is probably more like it, but going to the bathtub, not good. Even if you have a steel tub, it just gets filled with debris. Fiberglass tubs can break apart, get punctured by flying debris. Not very good places to be. Nice tub, but you don't want to be in there. Flying through a tornado, maybe in your dream. Now, I want to talk about where I'm from. I'm from Dallas, Texas. And nobody contacted me when they were designing Jerry Jones' stadium. Do we have tornadoes during football season? We certainly do. November 7th outbreak kind of shows you that. So let's take a look at the Cowboys Stadium. You have two arch stresses that support a steel beam, a roof, uh, you have basically most of the outer skin being 86 feet tall of insulated glass. Glass end walls that are 120 feet by 250 feet. And it seats 80,000 people. Unless you want to add some seats that people can't sit in. As I found out in the Super Bowl. This is it. This is the glass football, folks. Is that going to be safe in a tornado? No! They get tornadoes there, and they keep doing this. With bigger venues, they're making them much more easy. And are there any shelters here? There's no tornado shelters in here. You cannot put 80,000 people anywhere inside that except in the seats. There's your five-story glass facade walls. And I'm sorry, 
in the empire that I have, there is no amount of protection that I can muster up to prevent a tornado strike. Mother Nature is too powerful for me. So basically, I want to leave this with you. Can I get a commitment from all of you to turn to the dark side? To go ahead and advocate tornado shelters? And I see a raise of hands here of who's going to the dark side with me on this. Who is going to go with tornado shelters? All right. What about you? Are you going to be an advocate? Don't be one, will you? Sorry, don't be one. Don't be one. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. The emperor will be very, very proud. Yes, go ahead. Nobody had any questions? Has someone got your throat? Yes. Very good question. There are many manufacturers that produce tornado shelters, but if you do have to go through the actual testing and it has to be certified in order to become an approved shelter. So yes, FEMA approved shelters have to be tested and this is what differentiates what can be a substantial shelter versus the school bus and the ground type shelter. Very good. I saw someone in the back over here. Oh, who needs a cell phone? Well, um, you're, that's a really good point. When you're surrounding yourself with steel reinforced concrete, your cell signal will drop, especially if you're in the ground. But uh, I would say to let your neighbors know ahead of time uh, that you're going to be in the shelter when there's severe weather and to check on you afterwards. It's always good to know thy neighbor in such things. Very good. Anybody else? Yes. The other costs for the other shelters are pretty comparable. You're going to spend four or five thousand dollars. Obviously, it depends whether you want them in the ground or you're going to have them above ground. But really, it depends on your soil conditions, whether or not you know in the floodplain, or whether or not you have bedrock that's uh, outside your house, on what cost there is. There's significant variations in cost. The most inexpensive shelter I have seen has been the two-piece precast shelter, $1,800, goes in the ground outside the back door. Uh, these other shelters we're showing, above ground, four or $5,000 on up. Community shelters, of course, uh, range 25000 on up. Anybody from this side of the room? Yes. Oh, yes, DIA. I came through DIA the other day and uh, landed my spaceship there. And you know, one thing, I did see designated tornado shelters, and but just with the Frontier Airlines alone, the crowds, I doubt seriously that they could, could get enough people in there uh, to actually clear out a single terminal. I think, you know, while they have tornado shelters, I don't see them as efficient. The doorways are also pretty small. When you try to get hundreds of people trying to get into a tornado shelter, uh, a, a regular doorway isn't going to cut it. So, good question there. Yes. Uh, large apartment complex, large urban areas. Well, obviously, you don't have a place too much to put a shelter, maybe in the basement, 
but uh, you're really going to have to get down as low as you can in those kinds of situations. Even in the Joplin tornado, we very rarely saw that the bottom floor was completely gone in a multi-story apartment complex. Uh, we did see the top floors get taken away, and typically that's going to occur on wood frame construction, but I would definitely say get to the lowest floor and definitely put as many walls between you and the outside as possible. Okay? All right, one more? Okay. Excellent. Darth Nader, we thank you. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our banquet starts promptly at 6 o'clock. We ask that each of you vacate this building, or this, not this building. Don't go quite yet, please. We want to keep you. And be sure to have your name tags with you. But we'd like to ask you to leave this room immediately so they can prepare for dinner. Thank you.